Welcome to Noir Alley. I'm your host, Eddie Muller. Back once again at Bar 355 to bring you a potent cocktail of danger, desire, and dashed dreams. Just the kind of dark and suspenseful story we love to watch. And speaking of watching, it's a passive act that's been a staple of thrillers from the beginning. Somebody sees something they shouldn't, and the trouble begins. But it's a little different when the protagonist sees something they shouldn't and keeps on watching, night in and night out. That's not a moment of bad timing, it's voyeurism. And for some reason, it was the premise of several films made in 1954. First, there was the Barbara Stanwyck noir, Witness to Murder, made at United Artists, followed only weeks later by Alfred Hitchcock's classic, Rear Window, made at Universal. Surreptitious surveillance is also at the core of today's film, Pushover, a trim and tidy 1954 offering from Columbia Pictures in which the unwitting objects of the creepy voyeurism are two of the biggest bombshells of the 1950s, Kim Novak and Dorothy Malone. In fact, Pushover is the film that introduced Kim Novak, launching her, sometimes against her will, into the stratosphere of superstardom. Pushover is also the rare film based on two different novels, both by veteran crime writers. Thomas Walsh's The Night Watch is the base spirit, if you will. It provided the premise. A trio of cops stake out the apartment of a suspected bank robber. One of the guys, in classic noir fashion, decides robbing the robber would not only be poetic justice, but a fast lane alternative to years of dangerous duty for crummy pay. Added to the mix was the hook in Bill Ballinger's novel, Rafferty, which turns on the spicy idea of a cop falling for a gangster's woman. Mixing the two tales into a smoothly blended cocktail was screenwriter Roy Huggins, a whiz at terse exposition and snappy dialogue. This is one of the last features Huggins would write before taking his career to the small screen, where quickly he became one of the most influential writers and producers in the history of television, creating hit shows like 77 Sunset Strip, Maverick, The Fugitive, and The Rockford Files. Made under the title Killer with a Badge, this is one of the best dirty cop films of the era, which was at the time a prominent subset of the crime genre. It's surprising a film this good isn't more well-known, especially since it introduced one of the most popular stars of the 50s in a role tailored, literally, to exploit her sizzling sex appeal. Critics of the time didn't miss it. Pushover got reviews as good as an 80-minute genre picture could hope for in those days, and Kim Novak, only 20 years old here, impressed reviewers with her unique blend of blatant carnality and surprising vulnerability. It's a combination that pretty much defined Novak's screen persona, as well as her life off-screen. From the day she told Columbia boss Harry Cohn they could change her first name, but not her last, he wanted to rename Marilyn Novak Kit Marlowe, the actress battled to be herself, even as one man after another tried to make her over into an object of his desire. She's also an unusually sensitive soul, one who suffered a lot from wearing her heart right out there on her sleeve. She had virtually no acting experience when she made this movie. But it doesn't matter. Kim Novak is one of those rare performers whose essence burns directly into the film. As Kim Novak takes her first steps into this dark terrain, co-star Fred McMurray bid adieu to noir. Double indemnity had shown he could play more than lightweight comedy, but it wasn't until he'd aged into the kind of man he plays in Pushover that McMurray solidified his reputation as a dramatic actor. Great roles were yet to come. The Kane Mutiny, There's Always Tomorrow, and The Apartment. Not to mention Son of Flubber and, of course, My Three Sons. If Chip and Ernie had seen their dad in this film, his fuse being lit by a sex bomb, those boys would have grown up a whole lot faster. By 1954, the classic noir look was fading away, 
with the streets of Dark City being brightened up for film sales to television. But cinematographer Lester White didn't get the memo. He'd spent most of the 40s making Andy Hardy movies at MGM, but given a chance by director Richard Quine to shoot an out-and-out -out noir, White outdid himself. It's dark, it's desperate, and it's sexy in the most inappropriate ways. It's also one of the best noir films of the 1950s, Pushover. Director Richard Quine was assigned to direct Pushover because the studio believed that, having been an actor himself, he'd be sensitive to the pressure facing Kim Novak in her movie debut. Quine was 34 when he directed this picture, with a number of films, mostly comedies, already under his belt. In younger days, he'd been a dancing and goofing sidekick to his pal Mickey Rooney. And before making Pushover, he'd guided Rooney through his finest dramatic performance to date and drive a crooked road. These were Quine's only two forays into film noir, although his personal life had more than its share of darkness. In 1943, Quine had married Susan Peters, one of the most promising young actresses in Hollywood. On a New Year's Day hunting trip in 1945, Peters' rifle accidentally discharged, the bullet shattering her spine and leaving her paralyzed below the waist. Despite the couple's gallant efforts to overcome this tragedy, Peters even starred, confined to a wheelchair, in the noir drama A Sign of the Ram, their marriage fell apart. After they divorced in 1948, Peters steadily deteriorated, essentially starving herself to death in 1952. Although Quine would be haunted by Peters' tragic fate, he carved out a reputation for making lively comedies, many in collaboration with writer Blake Edwards. He reunited with Kim Novak in 1958 for the big hit Bell, Book, and Candle. And it was during its production the director and actress began a love affair, despite Quine still being married to his second wife, Barbara Bushman. By the time Quine and Novak made their third picture together, 1960's Strangers When We Meet, the director's best film in my opinion, he divorced Bushman and become engaged to Novak. Columbia Pictures made a wedding present of the fabulous experimental house in Malibu it had built for strangers when we meet. But Novak, always fighting to be her own person, felt unduly pressured and backed out. She and Quine would make another picture together, The Notorious Landlady in 1962, but their relationship was over. He'd have romances with other actresses he directed, notably Judy Holliday, Natalie Wood, and Fran Jeffries, to whom he was married for five years. He seemed to finally settle down with his fourth wife, Diana Balfour, to whom he was married for 12 years. But in 1989, Quine committed suicide in their Beverly Hills home, shooting himself with a hunting rifle in a manner eerily like the incident that paralyzed Susan Peters. Next week, I'll have for you an interesting B film with the blunt title, Violence. Being a film from 1947, be assured it will not actually live up to its name, but it features an intriguing premise and is made by much of the creative team responsible for the astoundingly weird Decoy, which was a popular entry on Noir Alley last year. Tune in, if you dare. Until then, see you in the shadows. Next on TCM, The Last Picture Show, then Hearts of the West, and later, The Green Pastures. It's not easy being TCM today.